Today we'll start with the agents that work at the 50S Ramosama subunit. And we will focus mainly on the macro lights. Keto um, lights, we've already done that. That's where your kitten belongs. And we've mentioned uh, that it's mainly just used for cap today at about 800 milligrams PO on the daily basis. So we can take that out. The, the posamides, those are your lincomycins. So we've done lincomycin and clindamycin. Agent that works at the 50S ribosomal subunit is chloramphenicol. And chloramphenicol uh, is a true um, antibiotic. represents the contribution of Venezuela to, to the medical field because that's the source of your chloramphenicol, Streptomyces Venezuela. Venezuela. So that is the source. The drug that you use clinically, that is the chloramphenicol that you use clinically, is actually a dichloroacetic acid derivative of what was originally obtained from that organism. It's a dichloroacetic acid derivative. And uh, in terms of its spectrum, it uh, it is a drug that has a very broad spectrum. Has a very broad spectrum. And uh, we know that it is universally uh, effective against animals. So you can say that it complements the amino glycoside. Remember, amino glycosides are universally ineffective against anaerobes. Chloramphenicol is universally effective against your anaerobes. Um, and uh, of course, we know that it can also be effective against rickettsial species. And it is effective against mycoplasma uh, species. And it is uh, also effective against your know, vibrio and against a leaking species. It produces a bacteriostatic effect in those organisms that it works against. In other words, you can use it for gram positive, gram negative uh, organisms, and uh, against anaerobic organisms. But it is bacteriostatic in those organisms with the exception of H flu. It is bactericidal against H2. Okay, and that's another example of why you cannot just say protein synthesis inhibitors are static and your know, um, cell wall synthesis inhibitors are silent.
she can't just say that it will be wrong. Okay. Um, the, the drug that is put on chemical uh, has a mechanism of action that to say that can interfere with PTS ribosomal subunit. But in addition to that, it can also work on mitochondrial uh, protein synthesis in humans because it can interfere with 70S ribosomal subunits in human cells. And that's a major reason why it affects the bone marrow uh, prominently. And that's also the problem it has uh, in the clinical setting. That's why people stay away from it. Uh, in terms of resistance, uh, bacteria can become resistant to the actions of uh, chloramphenicol if they produce an acetyltransferase that actually inhibits the influx of your uh, chloramphenicol or that can destroy the chloramphenicol, break it down. No rickettsia is resistant to chloramphenicol. Okay. So absolutely no rickettsia is resistant to the actions of chloramphenicol. And in terms of its agony, we know that chloramphenicol has two major salts. Uh, you have the palmitate and you have the succinate. The palmitate is the one that is administered orally. The succinate is the one that is given intravenously. Salts for that drug. The half life is about four hours. Plasma protein binding is negligible, that is nothing to write on about. And the drug uh, is high lactophilic. Because it is highly lipophilic, it can penetrate basically all the tissues or all the fluid compartments in the body, including your CSF. And that's why it can be used for meningitis, because it gets into the brain very readily. That's why it can be used for meningial plague. You know, because it gets into the uh, brain very readily. 
In terms of its metabolism, it can be biotransformed uh, by the gluconeal transferase. So an acetyl transferase is responsible for resistance. A glucuronyl transferase is responsible for the biotransformation of that drug. And this system, the glucuronyl transferase system, is very weak in neonates, that is in newborn babies or in children. It is not well developed yet. Okay. And so if you give chlorophyll to the neonate, the drug can accumulate in the neonate because it is not broken down by that glucuronic transferase. And when you look at its excretion, the excretion of the parent compound, that is the unmetabolized or unconjugated chloramphenicol, uh, will go out through glomerular filtration. But the glutronide derivative, that is the metabolite, goes out through tubular secretion. And this is another thing that affects neonates or newborn babies or small children. That glomerular filtration system is underdeveloped. That is, it is not well developed yet. So you give chlorophenicol to a small child or to a neonate, the parent compound will not go out in the urine, so it will accumulate in the body in that neonate, and that can lead, of course, to uh, a particular toxicity, which we will mention in a minute. Okay. So that's how the drug is excreted. It is primarily through the renal system, either through glomerular filtration or through your tubular secretion. And if you look at the adverse effects for uh, your chloramphenicol, the primary one is the one that has to do with the bone marrow. Okay, so you can get bone marrow depression. And that can manifest as pancytopenia, which basically means you will have a depression of all, all the cells that are produced in the bone marrow, you know, pan, which means all over the globe. Okay. And uh, in particular, it can produce a plastic anemia And that the plastic anemia can lead to death very easily. That's, that is why people try to stay away from uh, chloramphenicol. So you can get from cytopenia, leukopenia, uh, anemia, anemia of the, the plastic type. And then it can cause uh, what you call gray baby syndrome. In small children, gray baby syndrome. And given the reasons why, because the glucuronic uh, transferase, that is the metabolic system, is not well developed yet, so it accumulates. And then the glomerular filtration system is not well developed yet, so it accumulates in the neonate. 
And uh, brain damage syndrome is a deadly condition in, in those little children. Uh, you will see abdominal distension, so it looks almost like part belly. Uh, they will have torrential diarrhea, that is severe diarrhea. Okay, and they will get the respiration will be very rapid but irregular. Irregular but rapid respiration. Then the cardiovascular system will collapse. You get what's called cardiovascular collapse. Okay. The temperature will go down in that small child. And that is hypothermia. Then cyanosis will be present. And then you will see a grayish, grayish discoloration of the skin. That's why it's called the gray baby, gray baby syndrome. And then of course death will result from that. So it's a very severe condition. And that's another major reason why you don't see chlorophenicol used in small children. Except if that baby has uh, meningitis that is caused by listeria. Because listeria monocytogenes can cause meningitis in small children that can actually be deadly. The thing about that, the plastic anemia, or oh, the diagnostic, but mainly about the plastic anemia, is that it is not dose dependent. You can take one dose and get it. You can take 20 doses and not get it. Okay? It just occurs uh, randomly. And it's not time dependent either because. You can get it today, that is, you can take the drug today and not exhibit a plastic anemia until five years down the road. So it will be difficult to associate the plastic anemia with the dose of uh, chlorophenicol. So those, those are the things that make people actually try to stay away from chlorophenicol. However, it is very life-saving in some situations. So, indications. One would be typhoid. Typhoid fever. Okay. That's one situation in which chlorophenicol can be life saving. If the typhoid is very severe, you start with chlorophenicol to stabilize the patient, and then you can place them on Bactrim or Ampicillin. Okay. So this life saving is severe typhoid fever situation. Uh, it is also life saving in meningeal plague. Okay. So the senior infection. If you have uh, bubonic plague, you will use streptomycin. If you have meningeal plague, you use chlorophenicol. It is life saving in that situation, also. And uh, it works very well against uh, brain or the management of brain abscess when. When the brain abscess is caused by an anaerobic organism, okay. because again, the drug is highly lipophilic, so it gets into the brain easily. And it's universally effective against anaerobic agents. Okay. Peritonitis that is caused by anaerobes can also be treated with your. Uh, for a clinical. And of course, we mentioned this regular meningitis, uh, this 
especially if it's due to that listeria. Okay. And um, it can be used for bacillary infections, just like your tetracyclines. In particular, it is very effective in managing cholera that is caused by vibrio cholerae. Okay. Another indication, of course, is the human granulocytic alikiosis that we mentioned on the tetracyclines, HGE, human granulocytic alikiosis. And uh, it is also effective against chlamydia infections. Remember we mentioned chlamydia sitaki when we were discussing tetracyclines. You know, that causes sitacosis or ornithosis. The primary agent there that you can use is your chloramphenicol. Uh, so it's effective in all of those. And then number nine would be
And then the case of species can cause fevers. Then you have one that is called jail fever. If you don't pay your traffic ticket, that's what you get. You know, you go to jail and you can get you know, jail fever or what is sometimes called epidemic typhus. Okay. Usually spread by lies. You know. So that's uh, jail fever. And jail fever uh, is caused by your know, testia poa zeki. And trench fever, trench fever is caused by the Rotesia pontana. Okay. So that causes your trench fever. Then you have the spotted fevers. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, South American spotted fever. Both of those are caused by Rickettsia rickettsi. Rickettsia rickettsi. And then Mediterranean fever, that's caused by Rickettsia conari. And then your Q fever, which is sometimes referred to as nine mile fever, because back then they thought that if you walk nine miles, the fever would break. That's why it was called nine mile fever. The Q there actually stands for query. So query fever or Q fever is caused by Coxella borneii, which is actually a type of rickettsia. And uh, that would also respond to your chloramphenicol, or as we mentioned uh, last time, on that you take the cyclones, you know, your doxycycline will be effective against all these rickettsia infections. Okay. That's what we have for chloramphenicol. Neoparosin or bacroban is often listed along with the 50S uh, agent. It's a potent synthesis inhibitor. Uh, as defined for neoparosin. And it is a true antibiotic. So it is produced by a pseudomonas species. Produced by pseudomonas fluorescence. That's the source of your reparosin or Acrobat, so it's a true antibiotic. And it is effective only against gram positive organisms, only against gram positive LV capsa. Okay, so you can use it for infections caused by staph or by you know, strep. It works against both. MSSA and MRSA. In terms of the steps. Uh, for strep, it works mainly against your group A, beta hemolytic strep. That is your streptococcus pyogenes. Okay. And in high doses, it will be bactericidal. In low doses or regular therapeutic doses, it is bacteriostatic. And uh, of course, we know that it is only administered topically. Uh, it is administered by a You just rub it on the skin. 
and sometimes you can rub it in the nasal pathway. We have some little tiny tubes, uh, like unit dose, that you can just squeeze out and apply to the nose, or you can use the 22 gram tube, just apply a little bit on the Q-tip and roll it inside the nose. So that's how the drug is uh, administered. How it works, it basically uh, inhibits uh, isoleucine. DRNA synthesis. And so by inhibiting that enzyme, you inhibit the incorporation of isoleucine into protein synthesis. And so that's how it works. Uh, in terms of its indication, you basically just have one indication, and that's Metabol. So you can use methylsin topically for the management of impetigo because impetigo is actually mainly caused by scalp, Staphylococcus aureus. And sometimes it can be caused by your Staphylococcus pyrogenes, but it's mainly by uh, your staff. Okay. And uh, if you don't have Bacrobine, that's a drug called Altabax that is administered topically also for uh, impetigo. Or if you want to use a systemic drug, then one can use one of your PRPs, you know, penicillinase resistant penicillins, for managing that uh, intertidal. And your erythromycin is also very effective, as well as your uh, clindamycin. And you can use that first generation agent also systemically for the management of intertidal. So, topically, you can use Autobax or Macroman systemically, you can use your PRPs and erythromycin and pentamycin and uh, KFX. The adverse effects that are associated with macroban are very minimal. You can just get some stinging, the stinging sensation, uh, and uh, some pruritus, so itching. And it can sometimes cause a little dryness and a um, rash. And that's it. That's all you get from back of that. So, we need to be safe agent. The pleuromethylines. The pleuromethylines are, are also uh, true antibiotics because they are produced by that uh, pleurotus mutilus which is actually an edible mushroom. It's a mushroom, you know, the type that you can eat. That's the original source of the pyramidals. And uh, the ones that are available are the ones that are listed here. Ritapamilin is the generic name for that Ultimax. 
So you basically use it for entertaining. There are some anecdotal reports that it can be beneficial in acne, but it is not uh, an approved indication for that uh, drug. The formulin is a chloromethylene that is given IV and PO. So you give it IV, PO, and it's actually used for cap. You know, or let's say CAPP, you know, community acquired bacterial pneumonia. It works well in both typical and atypical pneumonia. And, uh, your typical pneumonia will be caused by maybe you know, spread, you know, uh, particularly PSSP. And um, It can also be caused by staph, sometimes then by your H flu, by your Moraxella, Cadoralis, and by Tuercella pneumonia. A typical pneumonia will usually be caused by your Chlamydia species, Chlamydia pneumonia. Uh, Which is Taiwan 
and Fields for Respiratory Agent. Um, the Legionella species can also give you a typical pneumonia. Uh, Francisella species. Legionella pneumophilia, Legionella piscogensis, that's what causes Legionnaire's disease. And Legionnaire's disease is mainly characterized by uh, pneumonia like conditions. And it was called uh, Legionella piscogensis because that's the first site of detection of that organism. Uh, there was a meeting of the legionnaires in Pennsylvania, okay? and that was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that's where this organism was first detected. So Legionella pisbogensis or Legionella pneumophilia because it causes pneumonia. administering it topically, okay, it's, it's a 1% uh, ointment. It actually gives you adverse effects that look like systemically administered drugs effect. For instance, it can cause nausea, it can cause diarrhea, it can cause pharyngitis, it can cause headaches even though you are administering it only topical. So maybe enough of it gets into the bloodstream to give you those uh, adverse effects. Uh, uh, these other agents are mainly used in animals. That is mainly for pet. Uh, usage. Um, Tiamulin is still considered investigational, but it will be used in animals mainly. So those are the chloromethylenes. The oxazolidinums. Okay. 
And so it is it is signed off against your strip. You know, strip of campus pyogenes, you have a group A, beta hemogenic strip. Uh, it's signed off against group B, beta hemogenic strep. Okay. That's the Peptocatus A Galactia. That's your group B, beta hemolytic strep. Uh, it is also a uh, cyber against uh, your Streptococcus pneumonia. especially when it is your PSSP. Penicillin susceptible streptococcus pneumonia. Penicillin susceptible streptococcus pneumonia. That's one. Uh, but it is static against staph and against enterococci. Particularly Enterococcus phaeacium. So that's the one that is usually lacrimacin resistant. So when you say VRE, okay, uh, it is usually that uh, Enterococcus phaeacium species. So you see again the protein synthesis inhibitor that is both cyber and static. Okay. And uh, if we look at the mechanism of action of your renazolide, this Prenol 50S, where it is a 50S ramosome uh, subunit. And in terms of its admin, the drug can be administered PO and can also be administered intravenously. The usual dosage 400 to 600 milligrams PO or IV, Q 12 hours. Okay. It has a bioavailability that is F factor of 100% or 1.0 which basically means that if you're treating the patient on an IV in the hospital and then they're discharged, you can give them the exact same dosage that you're using in the hospital without making any change in terms of uh, the dosage when you convert from IV to PO. So it's exactly the same, 100% bioavailability factor. The PO, you have tabs and you have the oral suspension. The oral suspension contains about 20 milligrams of phenylalanine in each dosage. And that is why one should not use Zyrox or Dimezolid in a patient who has PKU phenylketonuria because of the phenylalanine that it contains. That will worsen the PA and the PKU uh, situation. Okay. So um, in terms of its half-life, the range that is normally used is 4.5 to 5.5 hours. But in different studies, the, the range has been between three and seven hours. Uh, it's just that we take that middle, 4.5 to 5.5, as the half-life uh, of 
uh, drug. In terms of its metabolism, Renazolid is really not metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. Okay. It undergoes a non-enzymatic biotransformation. You get the oxidation of the morpholin ring in that drug's structure. It's an oxidative process. You get uh, that oxidation of the morpholin ring, and of course, that happens to be an uh, inactive uh, metabolite. Okay. And in terms of the excretion, only about 30% of that drug will go out through the renal system. 0% will go out through the feces. And the rest just undergoes non-enzymatic and uh, uh, new, I mean, clearance in the bloodstream. So that that is a drug that you can use to uh, discuss the difference between elimination. Clarence. Okay. Clarence just essentially re re refers to disappearance from the bloodstream. You know, a drug can disappear from the bloodstream either through metabolism or, the, or through redistribution or through excretion. So clearance is not the same thing as excretion. The plasma protein for the drug is only about 31%. So, the the indications for Zymox, number one will be VRE, you know. After you've tried everything else, because it is usually used as a drug of last resort, you know, if you have a very severe gram positive organism infection and nothing else is hitting that organism, that's when you go to Renezoa. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the reasons for that is actually money because it is extremely expensive. So it can be used for that. And two will be pneumonia. Uh, both, you know, community acquired, uh, and then hospital acquired or nosocomial. It is used for uh, staph-induced nosocomial pneumonia. Uh, and it would not matter whether it is MARSA or MARSA. Okay. So staph-induced nosocomial uh, infection, you can use that glenazolite. And then for the community uh, infections, you are you are really just talking about community acquired pneumonia caused by group A deratinolytic strep, that is streptococcus pyogenes. That's what it's used for. And then skin infections. Either be complicated 
or uncomplicated. Okay. For complicated triple uh, XI, it will be ones caused by group A or group B or massa or massa. Here. And then for uncomplicated, uh, it has to be either massa or group A, better hemolytic strip. The only time you see a low dose of linezolid used, that is on the lower end, 400 milligrams. On, on the DID basis as Q12, is when you're treating uncomplicated skin infection. That's usually when you see the 400 uh, milligram dosage use. And um, the adverse effects that one can get with the mesoid, uh Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and headaches. Those are actually the most often encountered adverse effects of Xylox. But the drug can uh, also exacerbate hypoglycemia. So if somebody has low blood pressure, it will even worsen, I and mean, low blood sugar, it will even worsen. So it can cause an exacerbation uh, of your hypoglycemia. But the one that you fear the most will be uh, that lactic acidosis. Even though the drug is not metabolized uh, by your um, cyclical P450 system, it has some amyl inhibitor properties and amyl oxidase inhibition. Okay. That means then that you have to advise the patient against, you know, using some, or taking some fermented food, for instance, you know. Uh, that beef jerky should not be eaten by a patient who is on um, Xylox, otherwise their blood pressure will shoot up drastically because of the monotonic pituitary uh, effect. Um, there are certain types of beer that they cannot drink, you know, especially if it's tap beer, you know. Uh, their blood pressure will go up. Uh, sauerkraut, they cannot take sauerkraut or use sauerkraut. Um, so, any fermented agent or food because of the uh, amyl inhibitory effect. Pseudomembranous colitis, which may actually be related to the supra infection that the drug can cause, uh, it can also be of some concern uh, in individuals. Uh, bone marrow depression. So you can have thrombocytopenia, lipopenia, anemia due to that BMD. Okay. That's what we have for the and so the demons. Uh, the 
the stratogrammus We only have one drug there. That's the sin acid. The stratogramins are a derivative of pristinamycin. And your pristinamycin uh, originally came from Streptomyces, Christina Esperalis. So that's the original source of Christina Mycin. Okay. And your synergy is a combination of two streptogrammins, streptogrammin A and streptogrammin B. Streptogramin A is doubtful pristine. And you see that pristine showing up as in pristina. Okay. And streptogramin B is queen of pristine. So synesthet contains those two streptogramins. Um, and the streptogramin is derived from pristinamycin, which was actually produced by this organism, streptomyces pristina espiralis. So we know the source of your synesthet uh, in terms of the spectrum of your synesthet. There again, it's just ground positive aerobic coxide only. Okay. So you do your streptococcus and your Staphylococcus uh, and Enterococcus, of course. Against your uh, strep, synesthesia is bacterial static. Okay, so against strep, it is bacterial static. And against Enterococcus, uh, like Enterococcus facium, it is also bacterial side. And the mechanism of action of the drug 
will be in her inauguration of the 50 years. The Darfur Princeton, that is stratigraphic A, would bind to an area that is close to 50 S. And it will cause a conformational change. So stratigraphy A, which is your double pristine, would bind to a site that is close to the 50S ribosomal subunit here, and it will cause a conformational change that will then increase or enhance the binding of uh, streptogrammy B to 50S. So one prepares the way for the other. Okay, so double pristine, Ostrepidamine A will cause a conformational change which will increase the binding of chronopristin or your uh, streptogramin B. So that's why they're grouped along with your 50S inhibitors. <coughs> so that's the mechanism of action in terms of ADMA for your synacid it is mainly administered intravenously uh, you will see about 7.5 milligrams per kilogram being administered on a uh, QH basis another situation where you have to wait for the situation to be basically life-threatening. So it's not used for VRE-induced bacteremia if the condition is responding to other agents. So that's one. And then, of course, your skin infections. And then the adverse effects that you can see with that drug, uh, 
this is another agent that is not metabolized by your cytochrome P450 system, but that inhibits your 3A4. So it is not a substrate for the cytochrome P450 system, but it is an inhibitor of your 3A4, which means then that it can interact with, uh, with several drugs. Secondly, the drug can cause an elevation of bilirubin in the bloodstream. So you can get high parabilirubinemia. And it can cause some edema and rash and irritation at the injection site. And that injection site reaction is the most prominent or the most serious adverse effect of your, of your uh, sinusy. Uh, myalgia, arthralgia, those can be present also. Effects, but the main one is that injection side reaction with that drug. Okay. And now we're left with the main agents, the macrolides. And we know the examples of your macrolides, the erythromycin. Those are the three that you see used a lot in the United States, but there are other macrolides, uh, erythromycin, for instance. Uh, that was taken off the market here, but it's still available uh, around, the, around the world. Uh, Deficit is used, of course, here in the U.S. It has only one indication, and that is for for that uh, deficit. Okay. Um, if we look at the source using erythromycin as the representative agent, so it's again your streptomyces Erythrias. That was the original source of your erythromycin, which was the first uh, macrolide. So it's a true uh, antibiotic. Then the spectrum. Uh, we know that erythromycin is mainly. gram-positive infections, so it's mainly gram-positive organisms, particularly gram-positive aerobic organisms. But as we go through the indications, we'll see the other specific organisms that the drug can work against. And we know that it is static at low doses, and it is cytal at high doses. In 
in terms of resistance, you can, I mean, an organism can become resistant to erythromycin through active efflux. So the organism just throws out the drug as soon as the drug comes in. And then you can see modifications of the 50S uh, site, either through mutation, like we talked about with your aminoglycosides, 30S mutation, but in this case, 50S mutation, or through methylation. So uh, the organism can produce a methylase, a methylase that will uh, basically decrease the binding of erythromycin to that 50S ribosomal subject. Okay. And then you have some enterobacteriaceae, that is gram-negative aerobic. Bacilli that can produce the enzyme esterase. The esterase can then hydrolyze your erythromycin. So hydrolysis by esterase produced by gram negative aerobic bacilli or enterobacteriaceae. And that's why you actually say that. Erythromycin works mainly on gram positive because many of those gram negative organisms elaborate this esterase which will hydrolyze your uh, erythromycin. Okay. Then for the admin, uh, erythromycin has or comes uh, in different salts. You have the base, you have your macrolides are usually basic. Okay. Uh, Tetracyclines are acidic, macrolides are weak bases. Okay. So you have the base, uh, you have the estolate salt, uh, you have the stearate. Different sorts of your erythromycin. Then you have the erythromycin ethyl succinate. Erythromycin ethyl succinate. And you have the glucectate. And you have the lactobalinate. Glucetate and lactobalinate uh, salts are usually administered uh, parenterally in giving IV or IM, but the IM is extremely painful, so the preferred route will be IV. It can be given IV or IM, but the IM is way too painful uh, for that. Okay. So in terms of the roots of administration of your erythromycin, you can give the IV, PO, IM, and of course, you have topical uh, the erythromycin. That's a drug called ilotycin, which is actually erythromycin ointment or tablet ointment. Give you 
severe hepatic adverse effect that is hepatotoxicity. Okay. It can be transient, but it can be severe. So that's why people don't carry the estimate uh, anymore. So that's root of administration for your rhythm accent. In terms of distribution, erythromycin is, you know, very well distributed. It can get into basically all fluid compartments with the exception of CSF. Okay. Erythromycin will get distributed into the CSF when you have uh, an inflammation of the meninges. So you can use it to treat meningitis caused by uh, your gram positive aerobic bacilli, you know, if the meninges are inflamed. So that's in terms of uh, distribution. It is one of the few antibacterial agents that can actually penetrate the prostatic fluid. We mentioned one other one when we were dealing with penicillins. You know, your GL serum, one of the ESPs, that is the Indian sodium salt of your penicillin that's administered orally. That is one drug that can also penetrate that prostatic uh, fluid. So that's in terms of its uh, distribution. Half-life is about 1.6 hours. Okay. And the plasma protein bound binding is around 70 to 80 percent. In terms of metabolism, there is none. And excretion is primarily fecal. So you see your amino glycosides will be primarily renal. Your tetracyclines will be primarily renal with the exception of doxycycline, which is 100% white. Through the feces and your macrolides erythromycin primarily fecal, so you don't have to worry about renal dysfunction. Erythromycin is one of the safest uh, antibiotic on the market. Very, very safe. So the adverse effects that we list, you know, uh, I mean they can occur but not frequently. So one will be the GI-related adverse effects: the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea abdominal or epigastric distress. So, those can occur. And the reason you have GI adverse effects with erythromycin is because the drug can activate Motilin receptors in the GI tract. And so you say it has a prokinetic action. Okay. Pro mean forward, kinetic. 
kinesis meaning movement. So it moves everything in the GI tract forward. So by activating multilayer receptors in the GI tract, it can give you a prokinetic action, which is what's responsible for that GI uh, adverse effect that you see. Many of the sorts of uh, erythromycin actually work better if you give them on an empty stomach. But the reason you don't want to give them on an empty stomach is because of the GI adverse effects. And so you advise patients to take them with food, even though they would work better on an empty stomach. Uh, the only one that was not affected by uh, GI uh, acid was that estolate. And people don't carry it. This is the All right, so that's the adverse effect. I mean, the GI adverse effect. Uh, we mentioned about hepatotoxicity, which is minimal. Uh, sometimes it can lead to cholestatic jaundice. But we don't see that with uh, with the other sorts with the exception of that estrogen, which is not usually the same. Photosensitivity can be seen with uh, your uh, erythromycin. Again, very, very minimal. Skin reactions, possibly, just rash. You know, uh, again, not too common. Because that drug is, is very, uh, very safe. Okay. Uh, possible autotoxicity. And again, not too frequent. Bacterial spectrum. This is one will be Lyme disease. And we know the causative agent of that. Uh, Mycoplasma infections. Caused by mycoplasma pneumonia. So, one of your a typical uh, pneumonia in Syria. And three, pharyngitis. Media. So, upper respiratory tract infections. Okay, pharyngitis, uh, media. Um, meningitis. You know, caused by your gram positive organisms, or sometimes when it is caused by Haemophilus species, you know, H flu, you can see the erythromycin uh, being used. Whooping cough. So that would be Bordetella pertussis. And it has to be the early stages of that whooping cough, otherwise the erythromycin uh, 
will not will not float. Uh, I mean, mass is here again has to be the intestinal amoebiasis. If it's extra intestinal, we get fragile. Acne. We have a product that you call benzamycin, which is erythromycin plus benzoyl peroxide. which would suggest that it has some effect against your clostridium tetany. Infectival, we've mentioned a little while ago. There are systemic agents that you can use to manage infectival, which would be staff in particular, or group A strep. Also, uh, it is that. Lymphogranuloma venarium will be used for that. We're talking about GI, okay, granuloma in the now, so it can be used for that. Uh, chancroid, okay, which is caused by Hermophilus ducrei. Chancroid is sometimes uh, referred to as genital ulcer. So it can be used for that. Gonorrhea, uh, and then non gonococcal infections, that is non gonococcal cervicitis, or urethritis, or proctitis. Okay. So we know the agents that will cause that. Urea plasma, urea medicum, and also your chlamydia trachonitis that can cause your non-gonococcal cervicitis and so on. Syphilis. Uh, erythromycin is actually no longer recommended for syphilis, although you go to some other parts of the world, you can still see it used for syphilis. You know, tetracycline is preferred to erythromycin in the management of, uh, of, of syphilis. Okay. So, those are some uh, STDs. And for pneumonia, it, it will be both typical and a typical pneumonia that you can, you can use these, uh, uh, these drugs for that is your erythromycin. So very uh, useful agent. Uh, and if I could just mention some interactions that we can see with your macrolides. There's a call, there's a drug called primozide. Okay. That is used for the management of Tourette syndrome. His brand name is Aura. If you give that drug concurrently 
with azithromycin or clarithromycin or erythromycin, you can actually get sudden death. So that's a serious uh, drug to drug interaction involving your uh, macrolides. And it is mainly because of the powerful inhibition of 3A4 by your clarithromycin and erythromycin and of course zithromax. Okay. And then with certain statins, you know, you want the uh, biotransformed by 3A4. Uh, you give them with erythromycin or clarithromycin, you get an inhibition in the metabolism of the statin. So the myopathy will increase in terms of incidence. So you get more of your myopathy uh, with those agents. Uh, with the junction, you get an elevation in the plasma level of the dioxin, which can then lead to ditch toxicity. Okay. With that pyramid, you get an increased incidence of arrhythmias. You can get even a prolongation of the QT interval. Again, because your macrolides will depress the metabolism of disoperin. Uh, oral anticoagulants okay, you get um, a decrease in their effectiveness because the macrolides will depress and you get a, a you get more of your bleeding okay, because uh, you are not metabolizing the comedin and so more of it will be present. And the same will go for things like um, the benzodiazepines. Your adult alkaloids will get an enhancement in their uh, effects. Bospiron, or Bospar, you get an increase in the effects of those drugs because their breakdown, their metabolism is being inhibited by. By your uh, <coughs> what you can use a erythromycin for, usually you can also use your uh, zithromax for. Okay. And even clarithromycin. Zithromax is a little different because it has the highest or the longest half-life, if you will. It's about 68 hours in terms of in terms of its half-life. You know. And uh, it it comes in some different packs. You have the Z pack. grams of azithromycin and you would use that just once for instance if you want to treat uh, gonococcal infections you will use 
one gram if you want to treat, say, LG, LG, lymphogranuloma, uh, venereum, you know, LGV, or if you want to treat GI, granuloma in Gunaa, you can use one gram. But for your gonococcal and non gonococcal urethritis, you will use the, the two grams. And of course, you have the tri pack, uh, which is 500 milligrams, and you give that once a day. Uh, if you want to treat, say, COPD, or if you want to uh, treat, you know, uh, community acquired pneumonia with your uh, Zetromax. Of course, we know if you give Zeta, it will be two on first day, and then one daily for the next four days. That's the dosage for your Zeta. It's 250 milligrams in there. Uh, it's a product called Azacite, uh, which is the ophthalmic, ophthalmic preparation of your azithromycin. So if somebody has, say, trachoma, which will be caused by the media trachomatis, you know, or if they have inclusion conjunctivitis, which is also caused by that chlamydia trachomatis, you can use that uh, uh, azide. There are only two indications for clarithromycin that you don't find with your erythromycin or with zithromax. One is PUD, peptic ulcer disease. that is used for peptic ulcer disease. And then the other is that Big Mac, Mycobacterium avium intracellular complex. You can see erythromycin used in that situation, but not erythromycin and not your uh, Zithromax. And only just mention babesiosis. Babesiosis can be treated with macrolides, particularly your zithromax. And uh, we mentioned the uh, babesiosis under your clindamycin. Okay. Babesia microti is the causative agent of babesiosis. We mentioned that you will get constitutional symptoms along with that hemolytic anemia, which is the major <coughs> manifestation of your babesiosis. Uh, okay, uh, this will leave it there. If you have recurrent infections with that prostridium difficile, which of course you can see that, and all you know, your deficit is no longer working, then one can use Zenfava, which is a monoclonal antibody that will help to take care of prostridium difficile infections. But that's after you've tried 
all the other agents that we've mentioned, like vancomycin, orally, bacitracin, orally, all those can be used for CBAC. If they don't work, you could use deficit. If it doesn't work, then last resort, you go to that monoclonal antibody, which is Zephyrma. All right, questions? So you said um, that the meninger, meninger pad can be, you can use for a very call. Yes. And the other one you said? The bonnet. Well, the bonnet plague, you know, you use treptomycin. For meningeal plague, you use chlorophenicol. And uh, like we said, it's, it's been life-saving in that particular condition because that's, that's a serious form of uh, plague. Yeah.